Hi, this is Jeffrey Tucker, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You might also consider supporting this podcast by sharing it and even donating. LCI needs your help so it can continue creating great content. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the statist quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm Doug Stewart. And I'm Norman Horn. And we're in the same room together. It's unbelievable. Yeah, we've actually spent a whole weekend together doing lots and lots of things for the Libertarian Christian Institute. And for this episode, we wanted to just have a drink and chat. And It's been the end of a long weekend in a lot of respects. And a long week for me. Yeah. Should we tell people what, what's been going on lately and what how this even came to occur? <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead. All right. So, you know, Doug lives in Pennsylvania. I'm currently in Missouri. And I happened to be spending a lot of time in the last week in Pittsburgh while at the American Institute, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers national meeting. And it just is in proximity to where Doug lives, so we ended up here. <laughs> proximity together. and relationship to uh, where well, he normally is. So yeah, where I normally There's a train ride to be had here. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, so I took the train and made it over here, actually, and... Uh, We've had a good time doing so, a lot of planning for for the future, and uh, maybe we should talk about that a little bit. What we haven't we haven't really um, announced a lot of those plans, so maybe we should talk about that for for a minute here. Yeah. So one of the things that we've actually brought up uh, a couple times, either on recording or in a webinar or our conference from last year, is a book that we want to produce that allows Christians to be equipped with short answers to some tough questions uh, that they are asked about being a libertarian as a Christian. And this is modeled after Mary Ruart's book, Short Answers to the Tough Questions uh, for Libertarians. And uh, we, are, we are well in the planning stages of that. We are, this is not merely a on our list kind of thing anymore. It's not a would be nice sort of thing once we're ready to do it, but we've, we've been in kind of in prep uh, for some time, I, in many respects, it's just researching and thinking about it and taking some notes and whatnot. But this was the big opportunity yeah. to really start crunching out what that's going to look like. Yeah, and so ink, I, ink has been spilled at this point. Yeah. <laughs> if not blood as well. Yeah, yeah. or if not, it will happen for sure. No, yeah. So we've been planning for that. Uh, we've been planning for a number of other things that we want to do in 2019, how our webinars are going to go, some other uh, really cool plans that we're not going to announce quite yet, but we are really excited about uh, doing. I think another part of that that's pretty cool, too, is just, uh, you know, the, the the plans we have going for the Christian Libertarian Review. You know, we're about to, uh, well, I guess I guess I should say we're we're in the throes of producing the second issue. Um, that's really the project, like primarily of Jamin Hubner, uh, who's been on the podcast multiple times. He's spoken at our conferences. He's done a webinar. He's a terrific, terrific guy, and uh, he's he's uh, he's our general editor for the issue. And uh, and although we don't have a release date yet for that, we are really looking forward to uh, actually going on a tear, getting the first issue actually out in better distribution. Uh, you know, you can you can get it for free online right now. Uh, you know, if you go to ChristianLibertarianReview.com, and it's really cool, do you find some excellent articles and book reviews? But we want to get it in physical hands in libraries. Yeah, and and so our goal here, and we've been talking about this for all, not a whole long time at this point, but we want to get it into as many uh, Christian college and seminaries and universities libraries as uh, as many as we can. And so, if you're interested in trying to support such an effort, you should contact us, and we'd love to talk to you. Um, but we're we're looking into what it's going to take to you know make that happen. And to how do can it. they contact us, Norman? Well, you can go to libertarianchristians.com slash contact, and that will you know give you a little contact form. You can let us know what you need, and uh, and then of course you know what we'll probably recommend you do if you want to support that is to donate to our donate to the organization in some way. And if you have a major donation, well, we can talk very specifically to you about how you might want to do that. And of course, we're five hundred one c three, so that's tax deductible. And so before the end of the year, if you want to get that, make that happen. 
it's a pretty cool thing. But that's only part of what we've been doing. We've had we've had a we've lot been of, having a lot of fun, a lot of fun doing some recordings and we've been on camera. videos and, <laughs> and goofy things. We've come up and, with some very crazy ideas that I'm pretty sure if we actually released them, you'd be happy we didn't. Yeah, that's <laughs> you're totally probably if you true. actually heard the idea, you'd be like, yeah, that wasn't a good idea. But we <laughs> yeah. we we, uh, we went through with, that's with some good ones. Brainstorming goes, I guess. That's but, how brainstorming goes. And yeah, they lead to the good ideas. In theory, <laughs> in, in theory, and I think in this in this case they actually did. So. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But that's that's been the weekend. That's been the week, and we're we've been thankful for that. The Lord has blessed us greatly, and uh, you know it's nice that it's nice that we are, you know, we have the opportunities to do these sorts of things and to you know do it in the proximity of family, and it's and it works out well. Yep. And one of the other big projects that we are getting very soon to launch is a new audiobook. Yeah, and it, but it's an audiobook of something you may have heard a little bit about before. That is the book that I wish I had read right when it came out. <laughs> it's called To Freedom, Why You Can Be a Christian and a Libertarian. And it's, a, it's, an, it's an amazing book. It's, it's short, but it is so dense and packed with like just amazing information that I actually – I was just so surprised that when I read it, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I, I've been a Christian Libertarian for 10 years, and I didn't know that these arguments – for my position actually existed. These are like amazing. It, it is a wonderful book, and it was written by and support, uh, written by a number of our friends of LCI. Um, some folks that some of you know: Jacqueline Isaac, uh, uh, Jason Huey, Elise Daniels, who also edited the entire volume, um, Phil Bluka. And this was actually written by a number of our friends. Uh, Elise Daniel is a good friend of ours, and uh, she was the editor of the whole volume and contributed a chapter. Jacqueline Isaacs, Jason Huey, and Leah Huey, husband and wife team, they're awesome. And Jason once uh, did a, a, one of our webinars a couple of months back, and Taylor Barkley and Philip Luca. Uh, all of these guys are awesome. We're really thrilled that they're part of our family in many respects. And, uh, and of course, we, you know, we expect to, to see great things from them in the future as well. And, and, uh, and I wrote the forward too. So, you know, if, if, if anything, you should go for that, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's one of the best we, forwards ever. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and we were big supporters of the, of the work itself. I mean, I donated or well donated. I, I, I was part of the Kickstarter and, uh, LCI itself was, uh, w- was, a uh, part of the effort to contribute to the F to contribute to the whole project and, uh, to make sure it happened. And, and, uh, and through you know a generous donation as well, we've been uh, spearheading the effort to t- turn it into an audiobook, and you'll be able to get it on Audible. Uh, it's super cool. You know, I, I actually had the great privilege of recording the forward. Thankful to my brother-in-law for helping that happen as well. That was really cool. Yeah. So for those of you who love listening to audio uh, because you are uh, you know on a commute or you don't have time to actually do reading, I'm a big audiobook fan, and so I just totally excited for this because I think uh, it's a great new avenue for people to uh, listen to the kind of material that we have. And there's there's really nothing that is out there in audiobook form that deals with the intersection of faith and freedom. Uh, so this is a this is just like the perfect project for LCI. Yeah, we kind of found that out in the research stage of some of this is that if you go on Audible and start looking for these things, you just won't find it. And so this is great. I mean, this is this is something that's needed, and and you know, and that's really the point of what we're doing as an organization is that we, you know, our mission is to get out there and provide Christians with material that they can consume and learn about the intersections of faith and freedom from this liberty perspective. And so, you know, the fact that we're doing this now um, is wonderful. This is a this is a unique thing, and we're really thrilled to be part of it. And we're thankful to to all of the contributors there for their work. And all their efforts, and, and especially to, you know, f- uh, to Elise and Jack for helping to spearhead this uh, this whole audiobook effort as well. Yeah. So we will we will do a more formal announcement about this book. Might even uh, mention it again on the podcast once it's completely out, ready to download. So if you are not on our mailing list, go to libertarianchristians.com slash contact. You can join our mailing list. Uh, we email when there's new articles. We email a digest at the end of the week. You can actually kind of decide whether you want one or the other. When you do a, when you do your sign up, you can you can kind of make that decision so that you get the right amount of email from us. And we also will just do announcements to everybody on the list when things like this are announced. So libertarianchristians.com slash contact, you can sign up. So that's sort of the news from us as LCI. I mean, what else is going on, Doug? We well, had, we, we, had we don't just right? – <laughs> Well, yes, we've had elections. Oh my goodness, I I was, 
Oh, I know people who would not be happy to know that I didn't vote. <laughs> well, you know, but you have an argument for that, and, and I it's do. not about and it's not about necessarily that you're not being participatory in some way. Yeah. So even on their own standards, you're you're. I am making right? the world a better place in ways that their that action of vote voting doesn't. Did. Yeah. yeah. So like, if I had gone to vote, the outcome would have been the same. There's yeah. There's literally no change. There's, there's no change. We so checked I don't all the numbers. And there's nothing that you did. That <laughs> yeah, no, nothing in Pennsylvania or my district that was settled on one vote. Yeah. But that's all right. Yeah. We, have, we, we like to think of ourselves as force multipliers. And I do actually things. vote. Uh, I don't always vote. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm not an anti-voter. I don't think that it's, you know, some – we've had episodes about this. And yeah, I, but we, I don't, and I don't we have principles about what that means. Yeah. I mean – Part of part of what we want to say, and is that you know, like if, if you're voting for something that is implicitly, uh, you're voting for someone or something that directly is uh, part of you know an aggressive structure that's coming up from forward. I mean, like you you can't really like that vote is is tacitly giving your acceptance to it, and I don't feel like that's a good and appropriate thing to do, right? I mean, that's, no, right. that's part of it, but yeah. there's many other there's many other aspects too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, the biggest reason I don't vote in elections like the general election, and, and especially this particular year, is if somebody came up to me and said, hey, you got to vote. And I'll be like, yeah, I, I can't this year. And they're like, what do you mean you can't? I'm like, well, in good conscience, I haven't really studied the people that are running. And on some of the issues, I haven't really brushed up on my knowledge of, say, you know, this particular kind of economics or maybe some <laughs> social things. And... I haven't had actually anybody ask me this, but I have. I, I kind of wonder what their like facial response would be when I say <laughs> I'm trying to be a responsible citizen and not vote uninformed. Because this year, I'm pretty uninformed about some of the candidates in my area because obviously it's the midterm election, and I didn't vote because I was uninformed. Well, okay, somebody could argue that I should have become more informed. Well, that that's a judgment call I had to make as a father, as somebody who earns money for my family and could only spend a certain amount of time doing this. Um, I don't want to vote uninformed. So, so that, okay, that's one thing you could say. I mean, there's also the aspect of, well, you have every reason to believe that, you know, each person on that ballot too is not, that, that is not someone you can, just tacitly approve of either. Maybe you don't. Right. You know, like I don't need to be fully informed to know that that uh, that you know Claire McCaskill in Missouri is a piece of trash, and I don't have any. I don't have any uh, bones in saying that, you know about that, or or to or to say that the, you know her, her opponent is also a piece of trash too. I, mean, I don't really have any particular. You know, uh, I don't. I don't necessarily need to have expert knowledge in all of their and their opinions to know that neither of those people are are worth it at all. <laughs> And and so thus I didn't vote for either of them. There's no way I'm going to do that. Uh, you know they they endorse aggression, both of them. So I'm not going to be party to that. Period. Would there be a particular cause maybe that you would vote for, like you know a referendum that is happening in your particular? Oh state? sure, sure, yeah. I mean, like well for us in particular, there's there's a <laughs> there was a proposition about the legalization of hemp, and that that's important. You know I mean, that not because I want to smoke pot. Never done so. Can honestly say I've never done it, and I don't intend to. But it is an important freedom issue um, because not not only because of just you know well, we shouldn't be jailing people for uh, possession of a plant uh, for but but also because it's a it's a it's an economic driver. It's an important piece of research that needs to be done for medical benefit and economic benefit. So these things are these things are important and and like. Look, I mean, I know that my vote doesn't really do a whole lot, but I, I at least can say that by voting, I'm demonstrating my preference in that regard, and I'm going to for try to force multiply that as best I can when I can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the other argument that people often will say, you know, I'll say to them, well, there's a lot better things I can do to improve the world yeah. the hour it takes me to go to vote and come back, et cetera. And they're like, well, you can do both. And part of me is like, well, not not exactly. I mean, yeah, sure, the thing I actually yeah. did, I could have done before or after I went and voted. But there's always trade offs. Time is scarce, and well, and they're it, presuming to know what your economic value is in that scenario, and that's something right. that they, I mean, like literally from economic theory, they cannot predict that. So even on their own standard, yeah. it's not very, it's not a particularly good argument. Yeah. Well, and for my friends, <laughs> for my friends who are. Uh, 
in opposite position of what I would vote for. I'm, I'm, I actually asked them, I'm like, I'm going to vote the opposite way you're voting. Yeah, yeah. Do you, are you, why are you encouraging me to go when I'm already telling you I'm not? I mean, I'm literally going to cancel out your vote if I, dog, if I take it, your advice. It's the most important election of our generation. Oh, but every election is. Really? Is it what? That yeah. is pretty much what Every election every is the most right? important election in our <laughs> ever, generation. Ever. <laughs> ever. Ever, ever. I mean, in and the we're history all gonna of the die. universe. <laughs> and if we don't, we're all going to die. So, if you, like, if you, I, if you vote yeah. R, you're all going to die. If you vote D, you're all going to die. Whatever, man. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> the world will just, will just keep on spinning. Yeah. <sighs> Voting is a way to affect change. It is not the it's way. It's not a very good one. <laughs> no, it isn't. But um, I, I don't. We don't want to disparage people from voting. There are good reasons to do so. Uh, we try to be as thoughtful as we can and make decisions on a case by case basis. It's not an all or nothing thing. At least that's the way I see it. You know, it's not like this religious habit. It's not a sacrament. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> not like so, the not like the state would want you to believe. Right. Or or mostly people on the left, especially especially this year, because this is you know this is the referendum year on whether Trump is successful and. You know whether we can get all the people who voted for him to vote vote for people who would be against him, and so uh, that's kind of the way that it, yeah, that, the way it took. But boy, it worked out well, didn't it? Mm. <laughs> How's that working but, out for yeah, you? How's that working out for you, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> so. But you know what's like the worst thing about this election, at least for well, from a personal point of view, I'd say one one of the one of the worst, other than all the aggression that's going that's going to be dealt in the name of all these people, but. <laughs> Good grief. The number of texts that I have been getting on my oh, cell phone my for these politicians has been mind-blowingly stupid. Yep. Uh, and the only entertainment I'm getting out of it is the occasional uh, responding to these morons and saying like, hey, are you going to vote? Are you going to be with me and vote for you know XYZ politician? I'm getting – look, I haven't lived in Texas for what? Uh, it's been how many years now? Four years? Four, three or four years? Something. To do. We're getting – we're going on the fourth year now at this point. And I'm still getting – I am now getting texts from politicians in Texas, including Beto O'Rourke and Ted Cruz in particular because of the unbelievable amount of economic waste going into that those two trash heats of the campaign. And, <laughs> and man, and this is what a what an ins- uh, unbelievable amount of uh, effort in those campaigns. But uh, I'm getting texts for them, both. And they both seem to believe that I'm going to support them. It's amazing. I, I, I find it absolutely mind Even if you wanted to, you couldn't. Yeah, right. <laughs> in your case, because you're <laughs> yeah. in a different state. Yeah, there, there is a, a one fun conversation to be had by uh, w- with one of the, the people texting me about how, uh, you know, I t- telling them that I haven't been in Texas for three years. And so, you know, how in the blazes, and I've never donated to either one of their parties, how in the blazes do you even have my phone number, let alone the capacity to text me yeah. and then ask for my support? I mean, come on, guys. Well, you, you get know, at, real? Least, at least they – the good news is they don't have it. Yeah. Uh, uh, or the good news is they don't actually know that it's an inaccurate – Yeah. It, like they, they don't have the – they're not that big brother. Like, yeah. They don't know exactly where you are. Otherwise, they wouldn't have sent – I do have a suspicion though. I think there may be one reason that, that perhaps why they got to me and that's because my grandmother who passed away in 2013 – um, had historically kind of had some donations done to Democrats in the past. I know this to be true. I mean, she was she was just trying trying to be you know your you know good uh, well, good hearted American. Your grandmother's generation donating to Democrats is a little more well, forgivable. Well, to be fair, anyway. <laughs> I, I yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I I even I got her to actually strangely enough. I mean, uh, and and let, let's be let's be you know we have to give a caveat here. You know, as the Libertarian Christian Institute is concerned. We are a 501c3, and we do not support uh, or endorse politicians, period. Okay, So this is extra LCI, and this happened a long time ago. Pre-LCI, but anyway. Pre-LCI, very pre-LCI, because yeah, obviously we, we didn't even exist in the time this happened, because, well, Grandma Horn passed, passed away in 2013 before we were incorporated. Nonetheless, I once convinced her to vote Libertarian. And uh, which was fascinating because, you know, this is a woman who historically like she grew up in the Great Depression. I mean, she uh, it, she passed away at the age of what, 92 or 93 in 2013. You can you can start making, the you know, some calculations and realize that she was born in the early 20s. Hmm. I mean, it, incredible woman. 
and uh, incredibly resilient, a wonderful, wonderful uh, woman of God. And, uh, and, you know, bless her soul. She's probably, she's listening in now. I mean, she, 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 I'm sure she's interested in what we have to do. I'm sure right, right. now. Right. Well, well, now she, she knows that, she, that now, all yeah. of her <laughs> opinions should be what we have anyway. So well, she's catching up. We, we, we should hope so. Right. <laughs> or at least have been modified to the even more correct ones. And, and, you know, the, the, uh, the eternal monarchist position of God, right? So, <laughs> blessed be the name of the Lord, baby. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, you know, I, I convinced her to vote libertarian at one point, which is just funny. Anyway, here's the thing. Why, why would this be relevant at all? And I'm going on and on about this, so you should know. All right, well, my grandfather's name, and I'm, you may not know this, actually, Doug. My grandfather's name was Norman Horn. And she went forever, even post- you know, Grandpa Horn passing away. It was before I was born, uh, but she went by Mrs. Norman Horn forever. Wow! So, I mean, I I will still get mail for her. At, for uh. you'll you'll get I can I can still in St. Louis, where I live now, get mail for Mrs. Norman L. Horn. L being, of course, the the, the middle initial of of uh, of Grandpa Horn. Uh, and my, my middle initial is not L, by the way, of course. I'm not a second, the second or a junior or anything like that. Um, but but that I still get that mail upon occasion. Anyway, I think that it's possible that they were just going back in the past and, you know, picking up voter rolls and picking up, you know, previous donors and whatnot. And, and, yeah, okay. and then they just, you know, somehow these – the records just have my phone number somewhere in there. I don't know how that's possible. This is how inefficient the state is. Yeah, they don't even know who's dead. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, sorry, Francis. Even though generally know. speaking, the state has a great interest in keeping yeah. people dead. Yeah, or well, they, yeah, they, they, yeah. They're really good at killing people and not good at keeping track of them. <laughs> Which should probably, maybe, on some level, that 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 should give us hope uh, against the surveillance like, state. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's what I was saying. It's like at least at least they ha- haven't got it down to an exact science <laughs> yeah. at this point. All right. So yeah. okay, this is that, a libertarian right? podcast. We don't really care that much about voting. Yeah, there's so many more important things, right? <laughs> yes, like like. How Having fun making videos. Yeah, and well, and anything relating to theology is better yes. than voting, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, anything related to theology. Anything. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Um, so, you know, there's some <clears> – <throat> you were mentioning earlier that there were some – uh, s- some hymns and some music that oh, were yeah. like liberty themed, and you were mentioning these to me, and I was kind of like, really? Like, I really? didn't even what? think about yeah. it that way. Do you want to share that? <laughs> share that with the world. Sh- share Arnie. that with the world. Yeah, I've had these uh, article ideas for some time, and I, I, you know, I've been wanting to, to at some point write about this. But um, it's interesting to me, you know, the the t- the Im- the importance that we and the church place upon our music, and uh, and in so many different and rich themes uh, come out of our music. And some of that comes directly from Psalms and psalmody. Uh, you know, there's certain traditions that really place a lot of, of, uh, of effort and uh, importance on using Psalms in worship. But, you know, it, there's also other traditions that use um, a variety of other forms of, of, uh, of music. And, and, you know, in our, in our churches, the churches of Christ are where I attend. Those are, uh, Primarily acapella based uh, music churches, and uh, which means that we don't tend to use musical instruments, and some aren't like that, and we don't take that as a dogma. We could someday maybe we'll, you know, we could, well, actually, let's just throw it out there and say, you know, the churches of Christ historically have been uh, acapella. Um, there are this other parts of that tradition, the restorationist tradition, include the uh, churches of Christ Christian churches and the churches of Christ disciples of Christ. Uh, you know, we those are all part of the Restorationist tradition. Have some differences in their practices and whatnot. Uh, the Churches of Christ, just the ones that call themselves Churches of Christ, and that's it. Tend to be acapella. Okay, that being said, you know, I've I've done song leading forever, and there's a number of songs that are kind of in the historical literature, if you will, that we get to sing that are kind of freedom themed in many respects. Uh, namely, like there's a song that a lot of people know that it'll come it'll come across it. Uh, you'll see it occasionally in other churches called "Crown Him with Many Crowns," and one of the verses uh, reads, "You know, crown him the Lord of Peace." The whole verse is about you know that wars may cease and uh, and that peace will reign on earth. And you know, taking taking into it uh, the theme of of uh, 
you know, Jesus being the Prince of Peace in a very serious way. And this was a song that was written, you know, in the 19th century. Um, and that's that's really excellent. Uh, and you'll see other, you know, other others, uh, hymn writers that will take up these themes in other ways, too. Uh, and, you know, one of those being Fanny J. Crosby, uh, who, if, if you've ever heard Lawrence Reed, uh, Larry Reed, the pre- current president or outgoing president of, of the Foundation for Economic Education, recent guest on our podcast a few months ago. It's wonderful. And you should take, you should go back and listen to it. Uh, you know, he'll, he'll talk about in his book, even on real heroes, uh, Fanny J. Crosby being this really fascinating person who wrote hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hymns. Um, and so many of, of which uh, proclaim the glory of the Prince of Peace, uh, and you'll you'll find that all over. And you know, what, of course, you, what many people don't know is that, well, you know, you, you learn all these amazing things about what she did as a as a, you know, really a true uh, minister of, of of the word in many respects. Not formally per se, but she proclaimed the gospel through her music and her work. And of course, they don't many, many people don't realize that. Just you know, she was this amazing, and she was also blind. <laughs> and she wrote all of these. She was born blind, I think, is what it was, and and did these amazing things uh, for the Lord uh, in that. And that's that's just pretty cool. There are other songs that you'll of course find uh, songs like you know, uh, Lord make us instruments of your peace. Uh, some really great stuff, man. And I think it's really a shame when churches uh, kind of forego the rich. Uh, wonderful traditions of hymnody that we do have um, in our history. It doesn't have to be, you know, that you sing a cappella. I mean, these can be brought in in other ways into into congregations. Yeah. But when they forego that in, in favor of, you know, just whatever's fashionable, that 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 kind of makes me sad. I mean, I understand yeah. why, and it's good to have new music. Um, but I do think we need to be careful about and and we should really care about our content and our mm-hmm. music. Yeah. Uh, I had a professor at you know as a as a grad student at um, an Austin Graduate School of Theology who used to talk about how you know hymns are portable theology, and I used to joke around with and even got I even had when I was in Florida I got the uh, one of the minister at a church to say in a sermon he quoted me in a sermon actually once and I, when I, when I told him after we, when we were meeting for lunch one day I said like look dude like you know your sermons are important I get it but uh, like. You know, two years from now, probably nobody's going to remember every sermon that you preach on Sunday. But you know what they will remember? It's the songs that you sing. That is really crucial, I think. And to realize that, you know, the music that we teach our children and we communicate every week on a Sunday morning is something that we inculcate into our personalities even down the line. And uh, to be able to draw upon that, I mean, that's the whole point of the Psalms, really, is that by singing through the Psalms that the standard, you know, we're going to just generically call it hymnody, even the Israelites that by we're building that into their kind of consciousness as a people. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean that in the, it, it, I mean that in the collective way in the best sense of the word. Yeah. Not collectivism, of course. We know that that's bad, but, but that kind of shared theology is something that is, I think is really cool and important. And it's something that's really, I mean, I, it's really cool in the churches of Christ, for instance, that, I can go from Austin, Texas uh, at the University Avenue Church of Christ and then go to Boston, Massachusetts when I when I spent some time there and go to, you know, to and, and go to, um, you know, the Church of Christ over there. And they have a similar hymn book. And even to some extent, I know what the numbers are. <laughs> and, you know, on Sunday morning when we all get up and, and go to church and we sing together, they use some of the same songs. And so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of rambling a little bit here, but I think where I'm getting at is that just as theology can be described as a conversation about God between the living and the dead, the people who came before us and that we're learning from and that we're bringing and teaching to the next generation, so is so is our hymnody. And I think that's really cool to see. And they're great hymn writers now. Uh, i Keith Getty, for instance, is just awesome. Stuart Townend is amazing. They work together even. I have my brother-in-law, for instance, I don't know if you knew this, he, is, he actually plays with Keith Getty. Oh, nice. Uh, Keith and Karen, yeah. And uh, and so, get you know, this is the guy, these are the guys that wrote, like, In Christ Alone. And uh, really, you know, a, a, new, a newer, a new-ish 
him. And by new, I, I was mean, gonna mean say like that last actually, 20 years. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> they had that was a while back. I was actually going to say that there are some hymns, there are some songs that feel more like the traditional hymns that you know, you and I grew up oh, with. Oh, yeah. I grew up in a tradition where we we didn't, it wasn't a cappella. It might as well have been, other than the fact that I'm not sure how many people in our church knew how to sing really well. <laughs> uh, and that's not to disparage anybody. That's just, we, huh. we, weren't, we weren't trained. But we had a single piano in a small, yeah, small sure. church, and we sang out of a hymn book. Oh, yeah. And, and a lot of churches I, do that. That's awesome. One of the things that you were talking about being formed by the songs and no one will remember the sermons or whatever. I would, I do remember a few sermons from my pastor growing up, but okay, I do good. know this. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I do know this, that when the church that I go to now, who has a full praise band with drum, I mean, there's at least six people playing a certain number of sure. instruments on stage plus people singing. Uh, when they do an instrumental version of the hymns I grew up with, those are the oh, yeah. ones that I, like. it's like comfort food. You yeah, know, it's like the nourishing yeah, comfort yeah. food that your mom made. You're like, it, it, it wasn't necessarily good, but because it's what you had uh, <laughs> all growing up. Now, <laughs> my mom's probably not listening to this, but my mom made wonderful food. But I'm just trying to say that the point of it is that it's what nourished you and what you really, really loved. Yeah. And um, it, it, I don't know. Like, I like it when our church does the hymns rather than more the modern stuff. But just, be, just because it's what touched my soul when I was a kid in yeah. my formative years. Hey, folks, if you love listening to our podcast, you may want to check out our monthly webinars. Every month, we have a different speaker take a deeper dive into topics relevant to libertarian Christians. If you've missed some of our webinars so far, well, don't worry. You can still download them. Visit our website at libertarianchristians.com slash events. And now let's get back to the show. Yeah, and my mom probably is listening to this. (laughs) (laughs) No, I have nothing but good to say about that as well. I mean, both on the food side and the music side, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> that's good <laughs> that's great right yeah but there's there's a lot of of great stuff that you know that we grew up on in in hymnody that you know i remember very very well and i mean even even the non-hymnody stuff i, I have a pretty good I have a pretty good ear for music i thought i think i can i can be reasonably confident yeah. in saying so uh i mean i i and i've been trained by i would consider you know some really great people to do you know acapella song leading i even do that now at the church where I'm at in, in St. Louis area. And I, and I did that for years as a grad student in Austin as well at University Avenue. You know that. You were there once. Yeah, <laughs> I was there. That was a, that was a great experience. Yeah. Uh, you, you'd prepared me for what it was going to be like. Cause, That's know, right, yeah. Have you uh, ever been to an acapella service before? I, ha- uh, I, mean, other, only, I mean, again, you know, you, you experienced the, the piano. Only, but... only in the sense that, like, the piano wasn't working in our church. <laughs> The piano wasn't working? Well, was from like time to time, it was like, you know. Was it electronic it was or it was just not mic'd? Is that the problem? Just not. No, it was like, I was sort of being facetious oh, okay. in there, but like, or, 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 or the I would go. The didn't show up. The, the pianist didn't show up. The pianist was sick or snowed in or, oh, you know, whatever. Happens. You know, that kind of thing can happen. So Yeah, you know, it's yeah. funny that that's that part of the you know historical argument for why, why a cappella, for instance, is that it sounds kind of, it, it's, it's, partially valid but you know one of the interesting arguments about it is that look as long as people are there you can sing you know I, yeah there was a uh, there was a person in college who was in the music department and they were like what's your instrument she's like my voice yeah. i never have to carry an instrument around with me that's fair yeah. that's fair yeah you know that that's one of the interesting arguments i mean of course you know there's others as well i mean a lot of people don't know is that i mean historically part of the argument for why acapella has been that that's that was the practice of the church for like nearly a millennia. Um, I mean, it was a it was a Christianity. So what was the basis for that? Well, like why did why was that? I mean, there was a number of it, it's just history. Yeah. I mean, that's just known. I mean, these are there's archaeological and, and historical evidence to you know that corroborate yeah. co- co- that, corroborate that corroborate all that. <laughs> Can't say a word. <laughs> Should I take your drink away? No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be silly. <laughs> No, it was great. Uh, that was the way. I mean, the early church was, you know, like a poor man. And, and I mean, it sounds kind of silly to say, but on some level, right? But it was a poor man's religion. Yeah. It was, you know, yeah. But uh, it, was, it was good news to the poor. Yes. And they responded. And, and it's not like, you know, at that day and age, there were a lot of instruments being passed around. 
<laughs> amongst the people. Yeah, that's so, for sure. But yeah, but the but, Churches of Christ argument in some ways was there was a theological basis for that. Like, well, uh, only in insofar origins. as it wasn't something that you saw in the New Testament. Yeah. But like, that's not really an argument people really make hardcore these days. It's yeah. more like uh, the argument that a lot of people want to make now, and I and I kind of agree with this on on a to a to a significant extent that uh, really you know the argument for acapella on some level is participation that it, it requires one to be participating because if, if people don't participate, then nothing happens. Yeah. So it's, it's really cool because, yeah. you know, those who've been in the tradition for a long time, you know, that they're used to going in on a Sunday morning and, and figuring out what part they're singing. Some of them read music better than what others. What about people who can't really sing? The people who truly can't carry a tune. Like, well, what hey, they you do? know, you get jo- joyful noises. Nevertheless, Okay. But I think people underestimate their ability to participate. Yeah. I, I think it's, you know, the saddest thing to me is, is people who who believe they are so bad that they can't, they ought not participate. And uh, that is okay. never something that is encouraged in the, in the scripture. On the contrary, it doesn't say, you know, even in, in the Psalms, it says, you know, make a joyful, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You know, it doesn't say comma. If you happen to be sufficiently trained well enough to make a decent right. noise, or if you feel like, good about your, if you your, feel, yeah, yeah, and I understand. Like, there's some people who physically have problems sure. that can't. No, I'm talking about you know, the like they just don't. But they're just they self-conscious. Like, the, I mean, yeah. look, I get it, you know, but that's something you can train yourself out of. That then you do it by participating, and that's and I mean, ultimately, that's what matters. I think that participation in worship is far more important than just your ability to. Do it super well. Now, I hope yeah. it's I hope it's clear that you know we're not advocating for. Uh, well, look, we should only have people who don't know what they're doing. You know, <laughs> doing the public speaking and doing the, the yeah. music. Or yeah. It's a good thing to be trained, and it's a good thing to get better and to do it to your best of your ability. But don't believe that just you're not because just because you're not Norman Horn standing up in front of the crowd uh, on Sunday morning leading worship that you just shouldn't sing at all. That's that's yeah, ridiculous. Right, right. So it's not all or nothing. Yeah, it's not an all or nothing thing. We come to it in different states and in different abilities, and that's okay. And I, I hope that any anybody who would listen, you know, to our podcast, first of all, is involved in congregations that participate in worship together. That would be my first hope. And secondly, that when you're there, that you you don't short circuit yourself by saying, "Well, I just don't sing well," or "Oh, I'm not as good as that guitar player up there." So I'm just not going to participate at all. Yeah. I mean, yes, there are times where you might need to be a little more quiet and to have the music wash over you, so that you can that you need to experience that uh, as part of as part of worship. That's fine. I understand, but hopefully, your participation is your normal and not your ex- yeah. and and not an exception to your life in Christ. Yeah. Anyway. It's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what you said there about participation is really important. It, you can, you know, not underestimate what, you, what you're able to do uh, and, you know, find a local congregation and be participant in that. I, we get a lot of questions, and maybe we can talk about this for the benefit of our listeners. Uh, what, what do you do if you're a libertarian Christian and you want to find a church, but everybody's a rabid statist <laughs> you know is there yeah. is there such a you know should should there be a libertarian christian denomination or what what kind of churches or you know flavors of christianity are more amenable to the libertarian position and there's you know i have a, like a dozen different ways to kind of talk about it. maybe not a whole dozen yeah, but whole, i have i have a, a handful of ways only a dozen <laughs> only a dozen right? <laughs> uh i have a handful of ways that i like to think about that uh, yeah. but just, what, do, what do you think is there a libertarian yeah. christian denomination or should there be well i don't think there should be i, I mean it sounds kind of odd to say i suppose but i'm i'm i've never thought about what we've been doing with LCI or, or prior to that with LCC as the as some sort of process of trying to make a new denomination yeah, on yeah. some level. I think we have enough. Yeah, I think we have enough. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the re- I agree with you. And I think one of the reasons that I would agree that we don't need to create one or there ought not to be someone else who goes and creates one. So imagine this. So we have what? 50,000 denominations or something like <laughs> that. And and we could even, even if we like number. be... 
even if we're like generous and say, okay, well, most of those are so alike. If they just knew each other, they'd be called the same denomination or something sure. like that. If we could kind of merge them, there's thousands of denominations. Forget fifty thousand or whatever. The, yeah. It's a very big number. So there's there's hundreds, there's thousands of denominations in the world, in the United States especially, and the the reason that they exist is distinctiveness. They were split offs from earlier denominations who were split offs from earlier denominations. And they may not have been things like church splits. It might have just been, hey, we're a community that gets together because we weren't sure where to go. And, the, you know, that house church grew and became its own thing. And they're like, well, what is our what are our distinctive values? And, oh, hey, you know what? It looks like that we're kind of Mennonite or that we are, you know, more assembly of God. And, you know, they, they join those affiliations or something like that. Um, but the reason that denominations exist just sort of in a sort of abstract sense is that people want a set of distinctions that set them apart and say, this is kind of the community that we are, that we belong to. These are the set of ideas. These are the practices. It, it goes way more than beliefs as much as I like yeah, to think it, more about theology. It's beliefs and it's practices. Yeah. Yep. It's all of that. Yeah. It's all of those things. It's beliefs and practices. And some of it's a little bit of culture, you know, yeah. um, you can, you can find, uh, you know, different cultures in there. Uh, as well, and the influences that culture had. Usually, the, those effects are practice related. Yeah, typically. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you know, the denominations exist because there's. It's all about distinctiveness. Do we really need a church that says, "Well, we're distinctly libertarian"? And I, I find that in some ways, I don't know. That just doesn't appeal to me. I, I feel like it's more like you know what we we as libertarians we need to be part of the the broader Christian community and whatever other you know what other denomination it makes sense for us as individuals because those denominations you know ought, ought to ought to benefit from what, yeah. what we have to offer. I think obviously we would hope that every Christian out there would look at libertarian ideas from a you know the political perspective and realizing well gee I should I should adopt these yeah right as you know as part of as part of what I think uh, and and that would be great but I don't think we can like necessarily just expect that right off the top yeah right and I don't think it's a reason for division no and the last thing I want to do is drive people away from their churches I think that if anything the adoption of libertarian ideas should drive one toward Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if you drive somebody toward Jesus, that you are certainly driving them in the direction of Jesus's body, that being the church. Well, body and bride. I mean, yeah. Look, that, that, the body of Christ is the church uh, in so many yep. respects. It's called the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, you, you name it. Yep. And so I, I would hope that in everything that I would proclaim, um, you know, in a generic sense, uh, is not driving you away from your home home congregation. Yeah. Uh, if that's been the case, then I'm sorry, and you sh and I and I apologize. I hope you will, you know, <laughs> I hope that that can be re remedied somehow. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't think that we really have anything out there that's like, oh, well, this is it. This is the yeah. this is the domination that does the best of representing libertarian ideas on some level. Yeah. I think there's some that maybe are better than others. Actually, the Churches of Christ are a pretty reasonable example yeah, right. on some level. Um, there's been a couple of cool call them Church of Christ luminaries, if you will, in our past that were you know quite uh, influential in their political ideas as well. Um, Alexander Campbell, one of the original founders of the Church of Christ, Churches of Christ in the 20, uh, 19th century, mm -hmm. in the nineteenth century, uh, was a uh, an advocate of uh, uh, he was an advocate against war. Actually, spoke against uh, spoke against war in the in Congress. Excellent, <laughs> it was remarkable. And he came, but he came out of the Presbyterian tradition. And frankly, there's plenty of people in the PCA or, or in the OPC and, yep. and a variety of different Presbyterian congregations yep. that are wonderful on these sorts of things. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, and and I'm, you know, I'm kind of going on an aside here, but sure. people like J. Gresham Machen was incredible. Uh, we've you know we've, we've seen in the last few months, uh, uh, Carrie Baldwin has written some articles for us about about Machen, and you can find folks like uh, C. J. Engel has been on the podcast yeah. before, has written about uh, Machen, and he's a, he was a wonderful Presbyterian. Um, thinker and, and theologian, terrific guy. Uh, but, but back to the Church of Christ, you know, there's David Lipscomb, who I'd argue is 
one of the foremost, you know, dare, dare we say, early anarcho-capitalist kind of thinkers in yeah. American history. He's absolutely remarkable in his uh, in his work and writings that d- described why the state was a bad thing and why it was against God. It was rather influential in the way that I've even done uh, theology. And I really appreciated that. If you if you ever get a chance and you see an old copy of On Civil Government by David Lipscomb available, you should absolutely pick it up. And if you ever somehow find a first edition, just buy it immediately, pretty much regardless of the price. <laughs> That's a treasure right so there. So you can find some hints or threads of libertarianism in a number of denominations. Sure. Yeah. And that, you know, you you could probably wax eloquent yep. on Anabaptists forever. Yeah, well, regard. there's the Anabaptist tradition, which is uh, is interesting because there's a lot of Anabaptists who are fairly left-leaning in their political because they have— Which is over odd, the, right? Well, it is. Yeah, over the past couple of decades, they've become very more social activists. And yeah. honestly, I think the influence on the— the brethren and the brethren in Christ, uh, the brethren movement, the Anabaptist movement, the Pietist tradition, on on uh, the Jim Wallace organization, Sojourners. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of connections there, and so it it hasn't been. Why is that? Well, why are there connections? I'm not sure I can speak to that. The problem that I see is they have failed to understand the the role or the limitations on which the theology of you know, mercy ministries and being, you know, all in favor of social justice, which on the one hand, I would say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm all about social justice too, but there's a context for that. And it doesn't mean that we vote leftist because that's because we want the state to bring about the justice that we think is social justice. So they, they've uh, been kind of going along. definition of social justice right, too, right? Right. And, and we can, we've talked about that in different, different venues, but I think the tradition is more like, oh, well, Hey, this sound this is, this is how Jesus would do politics. Uh, you know, we were sort of making fun of. Uh, I, we're here in my my room where I have a lot of books, and there's a Jim Wallace book, called <laughs> God's Politics, and that's a pretty bold title. Yeah, uh, there, you got to have. Yeah. A, there's a lot of hubris there uh, to <laughs> say this is God's politics. Well, it's really Jim Wallace's politics, and yeah. Jim, Jim Wallace has his opinions, and that's fine. Uh, we think that God's politics is a lot more freedom centric than Jim Wallace's, but yeah. hey, whatever. Um, and so I think the Pietist uh, brethren in Christ, Mennonite, Anabaptist tradition, that that whole sphere, uh, which is very prevalent in my area of the country. Uh, they see they see the how arguments many? for what's that? Um, go ahead. Just, just go back to what you're saying. How many? They see the arguments for uh, you know social justice as like in terms of an activist sort of sense, and that's just the way they've ended up voting. And I think, but here's the thing: I anytime I talk to somebody who's and I would call myself in a lot of ways very Anabaptist in my you know theological inclinations and stuff. So I have a lot in common. I don't understand why libertarianism is more attractive for a number of reasons, one of which is the peace the peace thing, right? They are absolute – I mean in, in terms of personal practice, they are pacifists in the, in the, in the classical sense of you know, the, kind of the impression that most people have of a pacifist. Like I just won't – I won't kill somebody. I won't use force unless it's just very mild or you know, only what's you know, non-lethal. Uh, and so there's that and libertarians are all about nonviolence and yes there for most libertarians almost every libertarian there is the self-defense you know uh, exception for for nonviolence but I mean good grief if you're if you're a peace person I don't understand why that doesn't find you know you don't find that it doesn't attractive. resonate somewhere it doesn't resonate yeah it resonates the whereas word. somehow the leftist position does that, that's what's really strange to me well it is and uh, what, okay, so maybe the left position, and I don't know because I was – these weren't my formative years, but I'm guessing that a lot of this transition happened during the George W. Bush years. Okay. And if it happened during that time – this is just a theory in terms of like, well, let's just kind of evaluate what happened. If the transition between being less political to more political happened during that time, it's no wonder that the tradition that is predominantly a peace movement – but apolitical in a lot of ways, started feeling an affinity for the political version of a peace movement and sort of just felt naturally attracted to people like Jim Wallace who were preaching against war for good reason, uh, even though it's a little bit uh, hypocritical for him to do so based on his history and yeah. origins. But that's another sure. – that's, that's a podcast we've already done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, go back and listen to that with uh, Bill Anderson. <laughs> uh, Jim Wallace was not always in favor of peace. He was very much in favor of, you know, things that brought about lots of killing. 
<laughs> like like communism. Anyway, yeah. uh, go back and listen to that. Uh, so I, I don't know. Maybe that's an explanation for it. But so you can find a lot of liber. Wow, we're way afield here. You can find a lot of libertarian like things. The Anabaptist tradition is very amenable to libertarianism for a number of reasons, um, and one of them is is that they are predominantly about peace. They are also predominantly about the message of Jesus. And that the focal point of the scripture, the whole point of scripture is to point to Jesus, that if we have an interpretive grid at all, it is a cru- cruciform hermeneutic yeah. that, and so forth. So uh, all that to say, there's that. The, the Evangelical Free Church of America, uh, which is actually the kind of church that I attend and a number of libertarians that I've met also attend, uh, not in my particular church, although I found a few there. Uh, the I learned when I joined the church over a decade ago that the the free church was founded on we don't want to be a state church and free churches tend to be in the northern northern uh parts of parts of america uh minnesota wisconsin new england things like that uh you don't tend to find them in the south although they do exist and part of that had to do with the they came from the northern parts of europe in terms of like you know who migrated they were from people who were from the colder areas of the world of Mm -hmm. europe i should say and so, but they were sort of Adam. They were called free churches because they were not state churches, as as mm, in the Church okay. of England. Yeah. And so there was a, at least in in nominal terms, a, an anti-state uh, thread or foundation to what does a free church mean? Like we are not going to be dictated by the free church uh, by the state. Uh, so that that thread is the Evangelical Free Church of America is a very loose. It's not technically a denomination, although I think people will just call it that because that's kind of the way it um, is. I think everybody kind of considers E free to be a <laughs> denomination. It is, but in like <laughs> some sort of formal sense, apparently it's not. It's more of an association or whatever. I mean, okay, fine, we can haggle over words, but uh, anyway, the point is that you can find Calvinist leaning E free churches that are very strongly like reformed in their like oh, theology, okay. and you can also find Arminian ones. Oh, that's interesting. Like you can have a very wide variety. In fact, the church that I go to uh, many years ago, uh, th- these pastors have moved on to different ministries. Um, one was an Arminian, one was a staunch huh. Calvinist, and they work together. And I, I have found that to be kind of refreshing because. Um, you know, for all the the faults that one can find in their own denomination or their own particular church, uh, this in particular doesn't seem to be something that divides us per se. That's that's really interesting for for that kind of coexistence to have happen in a church. Right it off is, the bat. yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, their their whole uh, mantra is major on the majors, minor on the minors. Sure, I, I cynically sometimes respond with, well. That doesn't solve a lot of problems because, like, now you got to debate over what's major and what's minor. But uh, that's, <laughs> uh, but that principle in general is kind of like, well, okay, fine. Uh, do we believe in election or do we not? Do we believe in predestination or do we not? Like, those don't become uh, major issues because then you realize that you're creating division in the congregation, and that's something that we do avoid. And and I will say that our particular church uh, has not had its, um, it's not without its share of divisive characters, uh, divisive moments. Uh, it's not perfect, so uh, I, I don't want to make it sound out like that this is some sort of like, We're you know, perfect church. this isn't like the coexist bumper sticker of <laughs> Calvinists and Arminians dwelling and worshiping together in the same church. It does happen, but it's not perfect. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Huh. So, but to, to the main question, is there a libertarian denomination or something that's more like it? No. Uh, the answer is you will probably find most churches are not libertarian. You will, you might find, though, uh, depending on where you live, depending on the number of churches that you visit, that libertarian uh, pastors exist, and they will de-emphasize the role of government in the life of the believer. They will do things that sound very libertarian, but I, you're probably not going to find a libertarian denomination. Maybe individual church out there that kind of leans that way because the pastor kind of, you know, is is a fan of our podcast and listens to us <laughs> and, and so forth. But uh, you know, outside of that. Um, you're not going to find it. So that leaves us to? with a dilemma. Yeah. What do you look for in a church? Uh, oh boy. And that's that's a big question. That's I, I have a friend who's really good at answering that question. He happens to be a leftist, uh, mm-hmm. but he's really good at asking the, uh, at answering the question about what is it important to do with with looking for a church. But I, I would say this, and like some, my advice to people is find a community where you can worship that you can feel like you belong to, uh, that doesn't 
compromise the beliefs and practices that you find that are very important. So if you believe that the Eucharist should be weekly, because that's an incredibly important thing to happen, because it's kind of why you gather to share in the body of Christ, then find a church that does that. And the ones that don't, you, you probably won't feel very much at home. If you feel like certain beliefs are just so important, and I don't mean libertarian beliefs. I mean theological beliefs that are, you know, kind of not political in, in particular. If you are... They're more important than just this. Yes, they're more important than just this. If you're a diehard Calvinist and you just cannot go to a church where the, you know, the leadership is not reformed, well, don't go to those churches. Don't, you know, just because they might be more libertarian than you than the ones you found. You're obligated as a Christian to, to find, according to your conscience, where the gospel is proclaimed. Yeah. And where they're being faithful to it. And if you can find that, then you're in a, then you're in a good spot. Yeah. You can be a libertarian in a non-libertarian church. Absolutely. I should repeat that. You can be a libertarian in a non-libertarian <laughs> church. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, okay, I can hear I can hear already My head's from exploding. the I can hear from the south already. But I live in the south and there's a whole bunch of god and country churches around here. Yeah, that can you be know, tough. It's it's hard. But there are connections you can make with people because well, even even God and country people ostensibly are really at least in nominal terms, they are really about some kind of freedom. That's what yeah. Yeah. That's what they say. That's, <laughs> that's, that's right. So, so and, and, you have to yeah. play, and even even as it pertains to trying to affect those people, you know, you play to their strengths. Yeah. You know, appeal to the good things that they say they believe. Yeah. And and get them to either, you know, affirm that over and over and over again and get more consistent in that practice or let them or let them kind of, you know, give themselves over to the to where they to where they have failed in this regard. Yeah. And then we, you know, and then we trust in the Lord to correct them and uh and use us to help do that at, at points, but to be but to be merciful and good toward them regardless. Yeah. Yeah, I have two other thoughts on the church thing. We'll probably just wrap up this episode. So we're at, um, is don't be divisive. Yeah, especially if you're at a church that's not libertarian or it's strongly anti-libertarian or whatever. Although you know you you might want to whatever, but so don't be divisive. Don't be the person who is always objecting to every single thing. Yeah. Be be graceful. Uh, I don't think everybody. Uh, listening. I mean, I don't know anybody who's been a libertarian all their lives. Well, and think about think about. So everybody's second. been to the point where they're like, "Oh, well, I believed wrong things about yeah. liberty too." And especially, and think about it this way, and especially you. And I, by that I mean me as well. Yeah. Right. That that at one point or another, I was in the position that they were in, or something similar, or yeah. something yeah. akin to that. How would I have wanted to something be something is equally in that? egregious? Yes. <laughs> right. Right. I mean yeah. that. <laughs> Don't dig too deep into Norman Horn's history. You might not like it. Yeah, <laughs> right. All right, okay. All right, right? let me yeah, yeah. Google, Google Norman yeah. Start Horn Googling here. that right now. This is Doug. Norman L. Horn. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, wrong, wrong, wrong initial. Norman, right. <laughs> so the other thing I would like to say is you can be too picky and just stay home on Sundays. And that's not a good that's not a good yeah, position either. You're, you're gonna have to make compromises. There is no perfect church. Of course, that's a cliche and you know, duh. No, everybody <laughs> knows there's no perfect church. Get over it. So you know that there's no perfect church. So find an imperfect church as as best you can. And join into and its join imperfectness. It, and join into its imperfectness because even if you do find the perfect church, please let as us soon know. as you start join it, as soon as you start going to it, it's now imperfect. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a fair point. <laughs> <laughs> because you know that you're imperfect. At least I hope you know that. Dear listener, do you know that you're imperfect? <laughs> <laughs> that could be the title of your next book, Doug. Yes. All right. <laughs> do you know that you're imperfect? <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> my next book. I yeah, read the yeah, first your book. first book. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, goodness. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of Libertarian Christian Podcast uh, that we've just kind of, you know, riffing here. <laughs> because we can in my basement office so that we can and have a little bit of fun it has been fun thank you for listening to another episode of the libertarian christian podcast if you like today's episode we encourage you to rate us on apple Podcasts to help expand our audience if you want to reach out to us email us at podcast at libertarian christians.com you can also reach us at lci official on twitter and of course we are on facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join thanks for listening and we'll see you next time
The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. The audio engineers were Doug Stewart and Jason Rink, and voiceovers were by Matthew Bellis and Caitlin Horn. If you'd like to find out more about the LCI, please visit us on the web at www.libertarianchristians.com.